morning, Old North. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. Thanksgiving is the one day that we pause to deliberately itemize the things that we are thankful for, right? So we make lists and we say what we're thankful for. So very publicly in front of you all today, I want to say what I'm thankful for. I am thankful for Jim Harbaugh in Michigan. That's right. Unbelievable. Uh, let us pray and redeem this moment right now, uh, and we'll get into the, the Word of God after we pray. So, Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, I praise your name for good music. It's how it readies our soul for your Word. And so, Lord, I, as we have proclaimed, let it be Jesus. That is our prayer as we open the Word of God. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations that you have given me in my heart be all about you. And so, Lord, as we sit and we receive the word today, may the theme of Jesus as Lord run through our hearts. May we be enlivened as we praise you, as we think on you, as we marvel at your work. And so, Lord, take this word produce fruit from it, and use us, Lord, to be effective ministers of your great gospel. In your name we pray, amen. We're in Luke chapter 17 today, Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. When Pastor Nick asked if I would preach today, I said I would preach with one caveat, and that is that I'm not preaching out of the book of Habakkuk. So he gave me Luke, which is fantastic. So Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, the theme for us today is indeed thanksgiving, thankfulness. We spent a week uh, previous, this last Thursday, gorging ourselves on good food and taking a great nap. We should be thankful for that. We should be thankful for our family, for our friends. But thankfulness is more than just a positive character trait. I want you to hear this. Thankfulness is more than just a positive character trait. For the Christian, thankfulness is essential to who you are. It must be at the very core of your being, of your daily practice as a Christian. Thankfulness must be front and center. In America, we're thankful for a lot of things. And on Thursday, you heard some of it. You watched the parade. You heard all the different things why, of what people are thankful for. We're thankful for, even as I just said, Jim Harbaugh. A lot of things that don't really matter. But in order to get to the heart of the issue of what we really are thankful for as Americans, we need to ask our kids what they're thankful for. Because kids always give the right answer, right? They give the real answer of what we're truly thankful for. And so this last Thursday, I snagged a newspaper that had an article in it about thankfulness and had questions to children, and here's a few responses on what our American children are thankful for. Erin says that she's thankful for ceiling fans. All right. Allison says she's thankful that her brother isn't a monster, because if he was, he would eat her. Aiden, who is age three, says that she is thankful for shoes. Lots and lots of shoes. And she's thankful for the people who make them. So Missy, who I don't know how old she is, but she says she's thankful for cookies. Lots and lots of cookies. Nicole says that her son is thankful for his dog, except that he doesn't have a dog. Claire said that she's thankful for her new scissors. And Genevieve said, I'm thankful for snowmen, my daddy, and quesadillas. Sure. We are thankful for a lot of things as people. Our children reflect some of that. And some of the things that we are thankful for are good things, but they shouldn't be front and center in our idea of, and concept of thankfulness. And so when I said to you as Christians that thankfulness must be at the center of your being, what is it that I mean by that? Well, in Luke chapter 17, we're given some illustrations here on what it is to be thankful what it looks like to be thankful, and what it looks like to be thankless. So let's look there right now. 
By the way, this passage is a story. It's a narrative. And so we'll work through it as a story. We'll read a verse, we'll comment on it, we'll read a verse, comment on it. Work through this as a story. And in order to get to verse 11 of chapter 17, we need to look at verses 1 through 10 in order to understand exactly what is happening. So the very first thing we can see here in chapter 17, verse 11, is this. That Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And we'll pause there. Why did Luke put that in there? Why is that an important detail to begin this whole idea, this story that we're about to read? Why is it important that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem? Well, this really begins in Luke chapter 9, when in Luke chapter 9, Christ says he sets his face towards Jerusalem. Friends, this is the final walk, final journey for Christ to the cross. He is making his way to the cross. The cross is before him, and as he goes, he teaches along the way of what it means to be his disciple. And so chapter 17 is Christ walking along the way, teaching his disciples on what it means to follow Christ. So verses 1 through 4 of chapter 17, Christ looks at his disciples and he says, if you are my disciple, you must be one who forgives, and forgives often, and forgives without limit. And then he goes on, verses 5 and 6, and he says this, If you are my disciples, you must recognize that the power of your faith does not lie in the amount of faith that you have, but in who your faith is in. The transformative power of your faith is found in who your faith is in. And then in verses 7 through 10, he looks at his disciples and he says to them this, As my disciple, you must understand that you must gratefully serve me. Be grateful of your service to me. Now, his disciples would hear this and say, how is this possible? How can I be forgiving? How can I be transformed by faith that isn't gigantic in nature? How can I be joyfully serving? Because that's not our nature to be people who serve. And so Christ then goes on in verses 11 through 19 and gives his disciples a living parable of how to be forgiving of how to be transformed, and how to serve the master. Let's look at this. We'll look at verse 12 now. Verse 12. So Christ entered a village, and he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. And they lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. One of the things that we constantly see with Christ is wherever he goes, there are those who are sick who are calling out for him to heal them. That's a normal thing for him to experience. Leprosy, by the way, is something that he had engaged before. And so in Luke chapter 5, he actually engaged a leper where he touched him and healed him. And he instructed that leper in Luke chapter 5, go to the priests, but don't tell anyone what I did. Now, if you were a leper and you had been cleansed of your leprosy, that's a hard secret to keep. (laughs) You can't keep that quiet for very long. And word began to spread, we're told in Luke 5, that word spread that this man had been healed of his leprosy. And so Christ was known as one who had the ability, the authority to heal. And so he comes into this village and these lepers know of this Christ and they figure we should see if he could heal us. And so the ten of them, this band of brothers, if you would have them be, are standing far off from Christ, and they plead to him. And the word they use is really interesting, the word master. For in that word is a recognition of the authority that Christ has. That's a heavy word. That's not a word that they throw out lightly. That's a word that carries tremendous weight in it. It's a word that notifies notable power, notable authority. And in their desperation, they plead, Oh, Master, have mercy on us. I wonder how often many of us in times of desperation have had similar pleas. Perhaps you have cried out to Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. Have mercy on us. As something in your life was out of sorts, you kind of went to Christ and just pled, Lord, mercy, have mercy upon me. What's the mercy that these lepers were asking for? What's the mercy they were asking for from Christ? Well, they wanted the restoration of their bodies back, right? They wanted to return to that which once 
was. It's an important principle here in this story. So often, in our plea for mercy from Christ, we aren't pleading for him to transform us. We're pleading for him to give us back that which we once had. And in that thought, we greatly limit our ability to understand the movement of Christ in our life. So what I see with these lepers, and I see in my own heart, how much of our discontent is because the things that we are experiencing are not the things that we want to experience. When in reality, perhaps God is allowing us to be in these moments that he might indeed transform us. And so then we go on in this story. Christ's mercy should be consistently surprising to us in verse 14. In verse 14, he says to the lepers, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Here's a few things to pull out of that that are significant. The first thing that is significant here is Christ looks at them and doesn't heal them. He doesn't go to them and say, you're healed, we're good now. No, he gives them an instruction, an action. Go to the priests. Why is that significant here? Well, Leviticus chapter 13 and 14 point to the rituals on how someone is pronounced cleansed from leprosy. They are to go to the priest, show them their skin, and for eight days, the priest will check them to make sure that the cleansing is true. Here's the genius of what Christ is doing here. This is really fantastic, by the way. Christ says, go, show yourself to the priest that you are cleansed. And in doing so, for eight days, these cleansed lepers will stand before the priest, acknowledging who it was that healed them. And so these priests then will have to be daily exposed to the reality that Jesus Christ is the one who heals. And he's the one who fulfills the law. And so for eight days, these priests who are out to accuse Christ have to acknowledge the fact that he has supernatural ability to heal and he's the one who fulfills the law. Does does Christ ever say in scriptures that he comes to fulfill the law? Absolutely, in Matthew chapter 5, and here he shows it. I have come to fulfill the law. Significant in the way in which he sent them back to the priests. It's also significant that they were cleansed. Notice it doesn't say that they were healed. It says that they were cleansed as they went. Can you imagine this moment for the men? Remember, this is a story. And so we are to engage it as such. There's a plot structure, there's movement that happens here. We are to get excited when they get excited. We are to sense their anticipation, their nervousness. But here we see them walking away from Christ as commanded, moving away. And who knows how far they got before they began to notice some things happening to them. But as they walked, they began to look at each other. And maybe they looked at Fred the leper next to them. And Fred the leper suddenly looked a little different. Those marks that once defined his face were gone now. His skin that was once gray and ashy now had a color to it. Everything that was once broken down began to be restored. And so you're looking at Fred the leper and you're like, what is happening to Fred the leper? And then you notice that it's happening to you. The cleansing that occurred in that moment. Can you imagine the excitement that you would feel as you realized that you had and were in the process of being cleansed? What would your response be in that moment? Cleansing from the Savior, from the Messiah. Everything changed for those lepers at that point. Let me tell you why the word cleansed was used there there instead of healing. For them, those who were once unclean now were made clean. They were allowed to return to society. They were allowed to be adopted back into society. They were returning to their family. They were allowed to come back into intimacy. For all these years where they were sick, they had to stand far off and observe. And now because of the work of Christ, they were able to engage again. Then lastly, the shame of being sick was done away with. For this disease carried with it not just the shame of the physical ailment that was evident to everyone around them, but leprosy carried with it the idea that you were cursed by God. It was a judgment of God upon you. And so as this was cleansed away, Christ was removing the stigma that they were cursed by God. You see the significance here. It sounds a lot, by the way, like what he did for us on the cross. 
It sounds a lot, by the way, that of the work that he did for us as he bore our sins. He restored us into family. He took away the shame of our sinful state, and he brought us back into full health. His work on the cross. And so in that moment on the cross, as we come face to face with the beautiful work of Jesus Christ, we are faced with the same decision that these lepers face here. What do you do when you are faced with the healing power of Christ in your life? How do you respond? And that's the weight of this passage, friends. And frankly, that's the weight of the Christian life. How do we respond to what Christ has done in us? How do we respond to what Christ has done in us? Well, let's look here at the illustrations that he gives us. Verse 15 of chapter 17. Then one of the lepers, when he saw that he was healed, imagine that. When he saw that he was healed, he turned back, he praised God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. There was one, one leper, who at the moment of healing recognized his response needed to be different from the nine. And what was the thankful leper's response? What was the very first thing that he did to illustrate that he was indeed moved by the work of Christ, he returned to Christ. Friends, listen, when you come face to face with the healing work of Jesus Christ, it should draw you to him. You should want no greater reality than to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. And because of the work of Christ, that can indeed happen. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, distance, right, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For this leper, the healing of Christ produced within him a completely new understanding of healing. No longer did he want things to be the way they once were. Rather, he saw the the healing of Christ as an invitation to completely new life. Hear that. No longer did he see the healing of Christ as simply a return to the old way, but he saw it as an invitation to a completely transformed life. When you are thankful for the work of Christ, you will draw near to Christ, and you will experience that transformation that comes from him. What did the leper do next? We'll look at verse 16, I'm sorry, verse 15. We are told here, Luke says that the leper praised God with a loud voice. That is not a detail to miss. The loud voice. The thankful leper praised God with a loud voice. Why did Luke put that word loud in there? Well, we sometimes would just gloss over that and think this guy's really excited, so he's going to speak loud. Well, there's more to this situation. As a leper, one of the first things that degrades within you is your voice box. It's one of the first things that goes away. And so perhaps the Luke writes in here that the leper responded with a loud voice because suddenly he had a voice back. And the very first thing that he wanted to do with the voice that was restored by the healing of God was to give that voice back to God. To be loud with it. To be in such a way that that which was healed and restored was shown to be thankful to Christ. Secondarily, why loud? Why is that detail in there? Because it tells us that this man was not ashamed to praise God. He was not ashamed to praise God. So often, we are so cautious in the way in which we worship our God. So often, we are so quiet and reserved, so proper even. That's okay, that's good. But man, there are times when the welling up within you of praise for what Christ has done should bubble over as you are filled with excitement and anticipation for what Christ has done and what he will continue to do. I think of this, I saw this just two weeks ago, this little boy, I was out some, I was downtown at my office for C.S. Lewis and this little boy was with his mom and he was running ahead of her. And sometimes children's emotions are, are really great object lessons for us. And so this little boy was running ahead of his mom and he tripped and fell. And you know what happens when little boys trip and fall and they turn back and look at their mom. What's, what's happening on their face? It's just complete terror as they take in what has happened. 
And I watched this as he stands up, and his face is like that whole crying that you're not crying, but you're crying thing. That whole, oh, you know, you can't breathe, you're crying, and I'm waiting for it to hit. And he's running to his mother, and it's building up within him. And it's building, and it's building, and it's building. There's no noise yet, but he's running to his mom, and as soon as he hits his mother, what happens? Boom! Everything explodes. And the entire city of Youngstown heard this little boy crying to his mother. I kind of envisioned that reality for this guy. As he's going towards Christ, it's building up within him. He's like, when, I'm, when I see Christ, I'm going to praise him because look what he did for me. And it's building up that excitement and anticipation until he sees Christ. And it just comes out, the exuberance that builds up. Friends, may we live with a daily reality of what Christ has done for us, and may it be so uh, burdensome upon us, so obvious to us, when we feel the weight of what God has done for us every day, that it builds up within us this desire to praise him, until occasionally, from time to time, you'll be the one with your hand raised because you've got no other way to praise God at that point. Thankfulness results in true worship. And then what does, Christ, or what does the leper do next? He thanks God. Christ. He thanks Christ. He thanks the healer. And he doesn't just say, hey, thank you for what you did there, sir. That was kind. This wasn't a moment of manners. I can remember being taught as a young child that this was a lesson on manners in some capacity. Be thankful. This is not a lesson on manners. This is a lesson on life. This man comes back and the only way in which he can thank Christ is by falling on his face at the feet of Christ and giving him thanks. And this detail that we are told here is so important. He was a Samaritan. What is with Christ and Samaritans? We just heard a couple weeks ago a sermon on Christ and the Samaritan woman at the well. He is consistently with these people. Who were the Samaritans? They were the people who had no lineage to be proud of. They were the people who had nothing on this earth that defined them well. In fact, if you were told, that, told someone that you were a Samaritan, you were shunned. And so Christ goes to these people, and he says, Ah, my kingdom is for people like you. Not just Samaritans, but anyone who recognizes that their identity, their hope, is not found on things of this earth, but in the one who made this earth. So Christ and this Samaritan have a conversation here. And Jesus says to him, We're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this, this foreigner? And so he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. Some translations, by the way, there that last verse, verse 19, say, your faith has saved you. So this Samaritan experienced a healing that the other nine did not. Nine were, ten were cleansed, but one was healed. Friends, thankfulness is what this one Samaritan leper exemplified. True thankfulness, a thankfulness that was based not on himself or on his situation, but was based on the one who controlled his situation. Thankfulness, by the way, towards Jesus indicates true faith in Jesus. That's the crux of this story. How do you respond to the miraculous work of Christ within you? As Christians, we should respond with true thankfulness, a thankfulness that is not based on what we experience, but on based on the faithfulness of Christ within our experiences. Thankfulness that is obvious in our worship, thankfulness that is obvious in our praise, thankfulness that is obvious in the way in which we draw close to Christ. Some of you remember, at the beginning of our sermon today, I talked about the beginning teachings of Christ in chapter 17. And remember, Christ said to his disciples, you should be people who forgive. You should be people who realize the transformative power of faith in me. You should be people who serve me. And the question is, well, how do we do that? 
Christians, hear me. How do you respond to the healing power of Christ? You respond by being thankful. Thankfulness in what Christ has done for you will cause you to be a people who forgive. Why do you forgive? Because you've been forgiven. And to no limit. Christ did not put a limit on the amount of sin that he covered on the cross. And so too, as Christians, we walk with an attitude of forgiveness to those that we come in contact with. How do we experience the transformative power of Christ in our life? By remembering the work of Christ on our behalf. Being thankful for that. How do we serve Christ? By being thankful for what he's done for us. Friends, thankfulness is the gift of the spirit within us to erode the spirit of pride within us. Thankfulness will erode the spirit of pride within you. It will make you one who forgives, one who is transformed, and it will make you one who serves the Christ. Let us be a thankful people. John Wesley, some of you are familiar with that name. John Wesley was a young theologian slash student at Oxford in the 18th century. In one particular night, John was going back to his room when he came upon a poor college servant, a porter, one who took care of the students there. And this porter was a poor but deeply pious man. And the evening was cold, and all that the porter had on was a thin jacket. So Wesley urged him to go home for his coat. And the porter said, well, I thank God for this one coat that I possess. And the porter replied, indicating that this was the only garment that he had and the porter then went on to say to John and I thank him for water it's the only drink that I have during the day intrigued by this response Wesley asked him further what else is there for you to be thankful for the porter said well I thank him that I have dry stones to lie upon at nighttime." Wesley says well please continue tell me more the porter said well I thank him That he has given me life. He has given me being. He gave me a heart to love him. And he gave me a desire to serve him. Returning to his room that night, Wesley, the theology student, realized that he was a stranger to such thankfulness. The porter's ready thanksgiving for his blessings, even in the midst of his circumstances, revealed a genuineness and a depth to Christianity that Wesley knew that he did not possess. Wesley, by the way, in 1791, cites this event as one of the transformative events that drew him into a relationship with Christ. Thankfulness transforms ourselves, transforms others, and is evidence of a true faith in Jesus Christ. As Christians, why should we be thankful? Because we have much to be thankful for. So let us draw near to Christ. Let us worship loudly. (laughs) And let us serve him well. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I praise your name for your good work on our behalf. I thank you for the story of the ten lepers. And I would ask, Lord, that you would cause us to be a thankful people. I would ask, Father, that you would cause our hearts to be reflective on all that you have done on our behalf. Lord, that we may indeed reflect back to you your great work. Thank you for your redemption. Thank you for the redemption that redeems us in spite of ourselves, that forgives our sins and gives us new life. Thank you for your healing, your miraculous healing. Almighty King, you are worthy of our praise. And so, Lord, we as a people of Old North gather before you, expressing heartfelt thankfulness for your work. So, Lord, may our lives be transformed. May we be forgiving. Lord, may we be faithful. And, Lord, may we be desirous to tell others of your great name. In your name we pray. Amen.